Is Skywalker Ranch really a ranch? It's time for Must Have Seen TV, the podcast dedicated to the sitcoms of the 20th century. From my love, Lucid the News Radio, I am your TV guide, a Barb Hardly. And when I'm in my boy drag persona, I'm Brett White, a senior reporter producer for Decider.com. And so uh, now we're just going to say hello to the Chewbacca, to my princess Leia, Ethan K. Hi, Ethan. Just shoot me, Brett. How you doing, <laughs> Barb? Oh, hi. Just doing great. Uh, well, let's, so here's a, let's talk about Barb's accent. Now, for uh, new listeners who are, for some reason, this is your first episode, I am a drag queen, and I am in full drag right now, and if you go to youtube.com, you must have seen TV, search for it, I don't know what the URL is, you'll see video, and you'll see me looking like a fabulous uh, 1960s woman. Now, Ethan, I'm trying to, like, now, like, you know, I'm seven months into being Barb. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, I do the accent as part of a character. But if people, you know, you watch uh, your RuPaul's Drag Race. And the line between you, the the person under the drag and the drag is a lot more blurry. And yeah. very few people actually use affectations in their drag on the show. Now, when they're on stage performing like a Ben De La Creme one woman show, well, she's in her character right. i don't know i'm just trying to figure out like i like i don't you know well i mean who, imagine what, if what? it's if you're doing an improv scene and you have not only are you coming up with things on the fly but you're also expanding your character and making your character more layered that just means that you have more things to keep track of while you're working yeah so there's pluses and minuses to that pluses you know you have a really well-rounded character minuses it's twice as hard <laughs> Well, so like, I, so in my drag journey, I've tried to like tell myself to not limit what Barb is because mm-hmm. I'm still, you know, I'm discovering I, you know, if I want to wear a certain dress, I'm going to wear a dress, I'll wear a wig mm-hmm. like I'll do. Barb is supposed to be like a sitcom side character. But, you know, as if you'll go to my Instagram, uh, Barb Hardly, you will see some very glamorous looks because I've gotten kind of into pageant drag, weirdly enough. But I couch that in like Ava Gabor is like the vibe I'm going for there. So therefore, it's and you're, still- And similar. you're not just a sidekick. You've you've done your own special. I uh, know I have. Barb has starred in her own Christmas Start. special. So so yeah, I so like, you know, I'm- And I my accent drifts in and out on must have seen TV. So it's, you know, uh, who knows? I think, you know- it, I might be right or wrong on this, but I think that your Barb accent is just a heightened version of the Brett accent. Which is you, oh, wow. you're from, you know, you're from I'm Tennessee. From Tennessee. You have a little bit of a. <laughs> you can't. You're, from... you, you're not losing that that part of you. You still have that that little bit of it's southern, a... you know, tweak. It's a heightened. That's I mean, drag as as RuPaul says, drag reveals who you are, and this is who I am. Uh, but yeah, so born yes. southern. Still, still figuring that Southern out. Now, for all the people watching on YouTube, I do have to show off what I'm wearing. So, um, And it is really nice today. It is I, that I, great I, go-go look. Aha, look at that. Wait, I mean, you can't even really see. I need to, I mean, there'll be, I mean, the skirt is short, honey. <laughs> but you've got um, the great cuffs that I've always, like, I've loved the big cuffs from the 19th. 19- 60s going back to like french fashion from the 1700s those really big cuffs that oh i wish i had those i i used to unbutton my sleeves in oh. high school if i wore a oh. long shirt just so i could have those kind of long cuff things well, uh this... really because keith moon did it in like one or two oh, live performances okay. where he actually wore like in the 60s they were they were using those big cuffs and he was dressed like that i was like oh man that's the height of fashion 30 <laughs> years ago <laughs> um but yeah, I mean, this is going to be a very fashionable episode. Um, but before that, let's uh, get to just a reminder, everyone, leave comments on uh, Twitter if you want to, Instagram. Uh, you can email TV at Gmail. You can also leave reviews in iTunes, which would be muy apreci- apreciado. <laughs> the only ones I can access are the ones on YouTube. So that might be artificially inflating our YouTube view count because I, I go mean, over there every so often and be like, what's uh 
didn't even comment on that. And some people have. Thank you very much for doing so. Mm -hmm. um, keep doing it because I'll I tend to respond to them. You know. Yeah, I mean, and I always I'm always I also wanted to show off the purse that I have, oh which my is God. an orange. It's an <laughs> orange. It's an orange. Anyway, yeah, I so I have that right here. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> what are you watching right now? Uh, two shows just came out. Uh, and me watching in the last couple of days, Poker Face mm -hmm. has been a lot of fun. That's uh Ryan Johnson and <sighs> uh, Natasha Leone. My has husband, been great. In another parallel dimension, Ryan Johnson. We are married, <laughs> <So> that... Ryan. <laughs> That's been great. That just came out on Thursday and four episodes are available on Peacock. And the other one just dropped, I think at the same time, Shrinking on Apple TV, uh, created by Brett Goldstein from Ted Lasso. And, and Bill Lawrence starring... of uh, Spin City. Of Spin City, yeah. <laughs> Scrubs and Ted um, Lasso. We, we did Spin City. We talked a little bit about him. <laughs> Uh, and not surprising, his wife is is on that show on Shrinking as well. But it's it's Jason Siegel and Harrison Ford are in it. Mm -hmm. Um, it's yeah, we watched two episodes of it last night, and we both really liked it, Megan and I. So well, yeah, we need know, to those watch two. It What about still? you? I mean, Poker Face is what I'm obsessed with, and I am. You know, I got to see screeners early, so I've actually seen the first six episodes. <laughs> Son of a uh, but no, I mean, like it is perfect. It is such a delight <laughs> it might be one of the most perfect shows i've seen in a while it's just so much fun uh i love the episodic nature how every episode is a different adventure natasha leone can do anything she is so <laughs> funny in this uh and it's just a damn delight i have no complaints about it just really enjoyed the four episodes that are up there right now there's nothing I can be like, oh, the script is weak or like this character. No, it's all quality. It's it's and, all there on the screen. And it's such a lovely throwback to all of the 70s and 80s mystery of the week shows. Mm -hmm. I mean, Columbo is its um, primary inspiration, which I watched the first episode of Columbo last night. Uh, and it's very Columbo. It's it's yeah. that whole, you know, there's just one thing that's not yeah. <laughs> sitting right with me. This I just can I ask you one more question? It's one yeah. thing that's doesn't make sense to me. Like she does that every episode. Yeah, because I mean, they show you the murder in the first like ten minutes. The first ten minutes is just like a show, and then she arrives in the like pre-established mm -hmm. show almost. Like it's so great. Um, and so if this. Uh, sparks a revival of heart to heart. I already have ideas. Um, I have very specific <laughs> ideas that you have to uh, rules you have to follow in order to make it actually feel like heart to heart. So uh, TV execs hit me up. Uh, and uh, and uh, literary agents. Yes, talk and literary to agents, Dr. please, please. <laughs> make me feel better every time i do drag instead of work on my book i feel like i'm neglecting one thing for the other like they're children of mine um and i'm trying to figure out ways to make them both work but i don't really know if i can do a, a harem drag look i just feel like that's not a good 2023 no look. i mean something Jeannie... should probably stay back in the past <laughs> Jeannie does actually dress like this in the later seasons when she wears normal clothes. So that's also, I'm trying, I need to look at some of those looks. Barbara Anyway, Eden. ooh, Barb Hardly, Barbara Eden, the team up we've been waiting for. Hardly Barb Eden. <laughs> ooh, but this week we'll be traveling to November 24th, 1998. A Bug's Life ruled the box office. Lately by Devon topped the charts and NBC aired the Just Shoot Me episode, The List. Ethan, you must have seen The List before today. I will admit that I did not see The List. And I will also admit that I have, this is the first Just Shoot Me episode that I've watched from start to finish. Ever? Uh Ever, ever, I, I've, 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 you know, turned it on and it's been on. I'm like, oh, this is really funny, but never enough that I wanted to follow the show. I never felt that Just Shoot Me had enough continuity from episode to episode to tell a mm. season long story. I think it was very, it was very episodic. Um, and I think that's one of the things that kind of maybe kept it be a little behind is that. It, it, it did have some stories like that, but it also jumped around time slots. 
Oh yeah, so, it was one of them. I think it, it was, eventually you know, landed fir- on Thursdays, or maybe it started on Thursday. Actually, I think it started on Thursdays with a six-episode season. Yeah. Went to Tuesdays with a thirteen-episode season. Stayed on Tuesdays for a little bit, and then when um, Seinfeld went off the air, they're like, "Who's going to take over Seinfeld? Is it Frasier? Is it just it was Is such it a just big Shumi? deal? Oh my god!" And then Frasier won, and then Just Shoot Me moved again to the, the Frasier time slot. Yeah. So it was, the show just moved around constantly. Now, now it, in syndication, you know, it, you can find it anywhere. But it's on uh, Hulu. yeah, it was. Yeah, it's on Hulu right now. That's where, that's where I watched it. I watched. I was a big Just Shoot Me fan whenever it came out. It was one. So 1998, uh, fall 98 means I'm a freshman in high school. That's where. That's where I was at this time. Uh, I'm a freshman in college. See, so all ninety eight. Uh, this is where my like taste in comedy is a little bit more solidified, a little bit more, uh, well, solidified and also narrower. Like I have taste. I mean, I have taste. Who knows if it's good? But like, I definitely had a taste. And so, just shoot me hit <laughs> in that taste because it was you know pop culture referency, snarky, um, ensemble. Like I love news radio. <laughs> Uh, and so this was kind of in that lane. And I do remember like Just Shoot Me was like the edgier comedy when it debuted, I thought. And I don't know if that holds it. I don't know if that's still true. I think it's still very funny. And I like that. That's one of the like always the criteria for every episode. I'm like, is this garbage or is this like actually <laughs> funny? And I will say that like I laughed out loud multiple times watching this by myself. It's a very funny episode. Yes. It was a very funny show. Uh, Yeah, so this week on Must Have Seen TV, we'll be talking about the Just Shoot Me episode, The List. It is the eighth episode of season three, and it was written by Marsh McCall and directed by Leonard R. Garner Jr. Here's how Hulu describes the episode. <laughs> Jack is upset when he's bumped from a list of the most influential New Yorkers and actor Mark Hamill stalks Finch. Ethan, how accurate is that description? Absolutely That's perfect. A plot, B plot, duh. Absolutely perfect. And Mark uh, Hamill's the B plot. Like you got yeah. Mark Hamill to be in a, a show and he's the B plot hanging out with David Spade. But I'm glad that he is in it throughout. It's not like Lou Ferrigno on Night Court where he was only in it for, you know, a scene that wasn't even that long. Mark Hamill is in the whole thing. So I, I like that. <laughs> I will go out on a limb and say that Mark Hamill's the bigger star. Uh, of then Lou Frigno, uh, yeah. Although I mean, in 1998, I mean, kids, y'all don't understand. Star Wars in the 90s was a different beast. Now, this is we're getting back up to the peak because the re-releases have come out in 97. Mm-hmm. Um, we are gearing up for Phantom Menace in the spring. So that's May 99. So we're yeah. like six months away from Phantom Menace. So like, I'm clearing off space on my desk for a whole bunch of. KFC cup toppers. I remember ta- those. And <laughs> Taco Bell toys. So I, I remember how we lost our mind over the Vanity Fair article that just had a whole bunch of pictures of just background characters from mm-hmm. Phantom Menace. And we're like, who is this guy? Is this guy going to be like the next big thing? And it's like, no, no, he's not in it at all because he was a background character in the pod race and they never just showed him. And they never showed him. It's like, Constable Zuvio, the original. <laughs> Deep cut right there, but very true. Yeah, I mean, I I will always say that the uh, the merchandising blitz, the publicity of Phantom Menace, is my favorite prequel. <laughs> Just like that that period of time was so magical before it even came out. It was so much fun. Uh, there, was in there, wait, there was good and there was bad because there was good because you're like, there's a renewed interest in Star Wars. We're getting some cool stuff. We're getting like the 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 special editions. And then there was like this, like this kind of collector existed, existed mostly in the mind of the media, which was basement dwelling <laughs> nerds that would buy anything. And Star Wars bit into that by like, we're going to release 90,000 different action figures. And all these collectors are like, we're going to buy 90,000 action figures. I still have so, uh, the entire first wave unopened. Now, I, do you have any idea if they held any value absolutely or... not they were absolutely. ubiquitous <laughs> yeah that's what i was gonna think get kind of getting that is that they were everywhere and everybody bought them and, and no one took them out of their plastic Mm-mm. expecting did... this you know whole wave of 
Star Wars yeah. nostalgia. And I have to imagine that this episode is part of that. And I'm sure I definitely watched this. Oh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so the episode begins with Finch, who's played by David Spade, who is um, Jack Gallo, who's George Siegel's personal uh, assistant and also kind of like the just the front desk person yeah. David Spade is. And I will just get it out. I, I feel like this should be a segment in every episode. Yes, I had a crush on George Siegel when I was watching this. <laughs> <laughs> freshman in high school and i still think that he is a very handsome man and i you, love all of his suits now he is an academy award nominated actor for who's afraid of virginia wolf mm -hmm. uh i mean done tons of work uh he got uh two golden globes for a touch of class i'm looking at this but did you know about oh he was also in an improv improv group with buck henry oh that's uh, a called called the premise group. love it did you know about his secret life no Wait, was he a musician or something? He was a banjo player. Nah. Yeah. He was a banjo player. He released <laughs> three solo albums of banjo <laughs> music. The only thing that you can find of him uh, on Spotify is the Canadian Brass did an ep did an, uh, an album of ragtime with and on oh. the cover it's like with George Siegel on banjo. Oh, that's so great. If you want to have a a, a quick little <laughs> quick little look Look up Smothers Brothers Draft Dodger Rag. Uh, he was on the Smothers Brothers. They covered Phil Oaks's Draft Dodger Rag <laughs> and with George Siegel on the old banjo. And it's great. It's just Good. adorable. <clears throat> and he just passed a couple years ago, like pretty recently. Like two, um, two years ago, I think, because he was yeah, on the Goldbergs. He was on the Goldbergs as the grandfather. Right? Yeah. 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 That's a yeah. show that's been through some changes because uh, is it Jeff? Yeah, Jeff. I want to say Jeff Dunham. It's not. I want to say Jeff, Jeff Garland. Garland. Jeff Garland. Jeff Garland. Uh, he is off the show as well. So that show yeah. has gone through Some a whole bunch of casting rough. changes, but still on. Good for them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So the beginning of it is he's going through all of the invites that Jack, because Jack works at Blush Magazine, which is like a Cosmo Red Book kind of Marie Vogue. Claire Vogue. Very Vogue. yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess it is. They wish they were Vogue. They seem more <laughs> more a Murray Claire. Now, um, so he's going they through dig all on of the blush. Yeah, Damn. yeah. As I hike up my new uh, D sized boobs, um, I knew you're gonna break those up. <laughs> I know. Well, I'm proud of. <laughs> um, no, uh, so going through all the invites that he's gotten as like a you know glitterati of New York City. But he's like turning things down. And, you know, of course, he turns down like a Playboy invite, which Finch, who of course keeps for himself. And the reason that he's he's turning all these down is because he has a two year old daughter at home and he wants to spend all his time with his two year old daughter and not going to charity events or parties. He just wants mm -hmm. to be with his daughter to the point of, you know, his big quest of this episode is he wants to get Barney on Broadway tickets. To was surprise Barney his two-year-old daughter. Was Barney on Broadway? I feel like probably. I know like Radio City, I think. I did watch the documentary, I Love You. I'm I looking this up. Whatever, I Love You, You Love Me, Now Die or whatever. I Love You, You Hate Me or something. It's on Peacock. It's a little docuseries about <laughs> people hating Barney. <laughs> um, There is, yes. Okay. Um. It was a musical called Barney on Broadway. Um, Real original but, title. But it was shot. It was done at Radio City Music Hall. Oh, so, okay. There you well, go. There you go. Um, so what? Oh, Nina comes up, who is played by icon Wendy Malick. Oh, who, fantastic. Who we love. We love Wendy Malick. We love a Wendy Malick. She's and on she... Owl House. Owl House is great. And she's, oh, the, uh, she's the lead voice on that, Ida. The oh, wow. Lady. Good for her. Right. right in that. You know, hot in Cleveland she was on. Mm -hmm. Um, So she comes over because she has a sneak preview of the Manhattan Power 100 list that like Manhattan Magazine is going to be releasing in like a week or whatever. There's a fantastic joke where she runs over and says, guess what I've got? And David Spade goes, what, are they stumped down at the clinic? <laughs> I like that. That was a yeah. good joke. There are so many just like good zingers in here. I've written down some. I've written uh, where we'll too. get to. Um, so then they're like, where is Jack on the list? Because Jack is not there. He has like departed. His daughter Maya 
played by Laura Sangiacomo, and her uh, character game is that she is like Daria, basically. <laughs> like that was the impetus. Is like she's like a serious journalist, and it's very like yeah. she's wears like a black turtleneck the entire episode. It's 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 a show that doesn't have an enormous premise, like yeah, an it's Al just for a Mork and Mindy. It's she the initially the the thing that starts it off is she's a serious journalist. She loses her job. She goes working for her dad, and that's like everything else just branches off that. They're kooky characters, and that's the show. That's because, like, so there was so children. If you're if you're like twenty or so, you might not remember, or you wouldn't know because you weren't alive. In the late nineties, like fashion hit a new peak of interest. Uh, like VH1 would air the VH1 Fashion Awards. Like that was a very late nineties. Like Zoolander comes out in two thousand one, and that's kind of like the apex of this like late nineties super you know we're super into just fashion everywhere and so that's, that's when, why this show exists that's when george michael came out with that video that had all the different yeah, super lots models. of supermodels baby they project runway comes out in 2003 or 2004 so like you know it this is like part of this like really big push of just like new york fashion cool and so that's what just shoot me is plugging into which interestingly enough along with those same lines David Spade's sister-in-law is Kate Spade. Oh, yeah. From Kate Spade Clothing. <laughs> yeah, which is insane because he's David Spade. <laughs> he's David Spade. Probably, uh, you know, probably, I'd say, one of the more successful people to come out of Saturday yeah. Night Oh, Saturday yeah, Night definitely, Live. yeah. Uh, so it turns out that Jack, he's always dreamed of made, just making the top 50. He doesn't want a top 10 spot. He's fine with top 50. Mm -hmm. But he has fallen from number 68 to number one. Hundred to which Nina is like, that's a fall of. I don't have time to crunch the numbers. <laughs> they had a, this was a really good scene. I like there were a couple of jokes that were really good. Um, where someone asks, "What, well, Nina? Where did you get this list?" And she goes, "Oh, it's it's from an ex lover, and I can't be more specific than that." And Elliot, the photographer, says, "Nina, you got to get their first names." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, when Jack comes out, they like they break the news to him, right? They say, "Well, you know, uh, your like your friend Donald Trump plummeted to number five, which is uh, if we could just magically go through all of sitcom history and just remove every joke about him, that would be great." He's it, kind of like the black mold of sitcoms. Yeah. He's yeah, just he's, everywhere. There are jokes about him all the time. Because he deserves to be mocked and has always deserved to be mocked. Uh, except now there's like insurgency and downfall of America vibes attached to it. And so. and blatant racism. Yeah, just like super, you know, anyway, so fuck him. And glad that was that one joke. And we move on to... Yeah. <laughs> really funny jokes like i i laughed out loud watching it by myself and that's that's the sign of quality sitcoming yes is when if you're by yourself and you're not trying to impress anybody is when you laugh at a joke definitely thumbs up just shoot me so like the interstitial parts of just shoot me like fraser had the black title cards and so just shoot me comes along and it's like a blush magazine cover and the camera will pan to one of the like what would be an article headline. Um, and so the first one that we see in the episode is British fashion empire strikes back. And oh boy, that should pick, tell you what we are into. What we're I really into. like I really like that framing device because yeah, it, re it, re it reads like a book where it has like a, a chapter heading. Mm -hmm. and then you read the rest of the chapter and you're like, oh, it's in a cute little, cute little uh, summary of the chapter. And like this one, not so much, but like later on, it's it does a good job of like setting the tone or like just kind of like getting you like into it's a good primer for the scene you're about to see. It kind it's of like classy. is shorthand. It's very good. Um, so now uh, Finch is picking up lunch for his boss, for Jack. And he uh, realized, does he realize or someone tell him Mark Hamill is sitting? Oh, someone, him? the the, uh, the maid oh, yeah. oh, because he's like, you're a big Star Wars nerd, right? Yeah. And he says, <laughs> I went to the uh, the Albany Star sci-fi convention. Yeah, in 91. Yeah. <laughs> and so we have behind him is handsome, young, er, Mark Hamill. 
Um, I mean, and to me, Mark Hamill just ages like a fine wine. He's wonderful. Uh, he's, he is, he is absolutely a wonderful. Damn delight. And he is at the table with a with a friend. Um, I'm assuming an actor playing a friend and not a real Mark Hamill friend. Yeah, the guy's name is Marsh McCall. I looked him up on. Oh, he, that's the writer on, of the episode. Yeah, so he's just you know. Good for him. Like, I'm going to write the episode and Mark Hamill's going to be in it. And I am playing the friend that gets to be in the table. I am doing So he's, but you, and you can tell just from the snippet of conversation that Mark Hamill is consoling his friend Marsh. But uh, if we find out that his grandmother died, that's a reveal in a second. But so Finch, like, of course, beelines over there. It's like, hey, Mark, you uh, remember me? Bro, the creeps 91. up like Nosferatu. Yeah. Just like... <laughs> the sci-fi convention in Albany. Uh, have you ever met anyone from Star Wars? I have. And I don't know if I should tell the story. <laughs> um, And, okay, so... Oh, both... no, yes, I know that. I know this one, yes. I, I... I'm going to have to tell it, because you asked me about it. Oh, no, but it's also really sweet. <laughs> it's really sweet. Uh, it's the story of how I, I, I made out with Carrie Fisher. <laughs> um, so she was doing her show on Broadway, uh, Wishful Drinking. She was doing it at, at Studio 54, um, which was turned into a theater. It was not... You know, you and now riding a in horse between your, doing cocaine, yeah. yeah. In between your cocaine, here's Carrie <laughs> Fisher. No, she was. This was, I want to say, 2009, around then. And she was doing her show, and I had just, I'd, I'd gotten front row tickets, and I was wearing a suit because I had just come from a big client meeting. Ah. Uh, from advertising big client meeting, so I'm sitting in the front row wearing a suit. And I did hear that she would pick people from the from the front row to come up on stage with her at a certain part of the show. So I'm looking around the rest of the the, the front row, and it's very very old, old <laughs> like people who like we go to see every Broadway show. We don't enjoy any of them, but it is a tradition, so Check, we have to yeah. be here every. And it was just like I was the best thing there, <laughs> so. At, at a part, she bring she she comes to the audience and she brings me up, and you know just a, a big hug and everyone's applauding and I'm I'm on a Broadway stage, um, and we do this like we do a little bit of shtick like I'm I'm like using my improv skills to just kind of like keep things going and like <laughs> it's really fun the audience is digging it, and so she it's right at the end of the first act so what she does is a couch comes down from the ceiling and she pretends to wrestle the person who's there. Like she's, she's going to kiss them uh, <laughs> on this couch as the, the curtain goes down. And I just, I make this split second decision that like, if she's going to come at me and kiss me, I'm going to kiss her back. <laughs> so we just we kissed on a sofa <laughs> on a Broadway stage. And after, and like the curtain went down and she's like, oh my God, you're, you know, you're so great. And we got a picture together. Uh, I'll, I'll put it on my Instagram. And uh, she, she gave me, um, uh, so she, she goes off and they bring me back out to the, the, uh, the audience. And as the curtain comes up for, for number two, uh, she, she, she calls me back up and to thank me. And she gives me an autographed pair of edible underwear, which I still have downstairs. <laughs> I need to put it in the shadow box. And she kisses me again with tongue. And it's just like <laughs> my heart just grew three sizes. She is such a <laughs> wonderful, wonderful woman. Aww. So funny. She is absolutely fucking brilliant. And her show is great. It's on, uh, it, they recorded it. it. It's, it's, it's viewable. So that's my making out with Carrie Fisher story. <laughs> oh my God. For everybody. I didn't even remember that when I asked. I was just in general being like, well, Finch meets a Star Wars person. So, uh, well, you've met Star Wars people. In, I in mean, I, so I have an autograph from Mark Hamill because when he was on uh, Seth Meyers, my friend is a writer at Seth Meyers. And so he got me in, like, he got me tickets for that mm. show. And he, he, he bought Mike Scollins, shout out. He bought a uh, old VHS of Empire Strikes Back and had Mark Hamill sign it. So it says, 
Brett, go force yourself, Mark <laughs> Hamill. Um, and then I've seen Harrison Ford live a couple of times uh in person most recently at d23 when he came out to announce indiana jones and john williams did the whole thing and that was star wars celebration as well there was celebration you can go there and you can see a lot of people you have a picture with yeah i mean yeah that's the thing is like i so then i was like wandering around the last day and i walked past like you know at these conventions they have the setups of you know their booths where you can go you can buy a ticket to get your photo taken with them and there was and Ian McDermott was sitting there, no line, just one person, and he was just having a conversation. And so I wanted to just like go up and like say hi. Um, but they were like, Oh, you need to buy a like you need to buy an autograph or a photo or something. And I, I think I was just like, Oh, well, I'll buy the photo. Can I do that right here? They were like, No, you have to go do the thing. And so I never got to talk to him because what they do, it is so wild, the assembly line. Like you get into a line and then you are just like move it's like dmv and they just like grab you put you and it was COVID, yeah. so there was a plexiglass between us and they're just like one two three click done and it was so i made eye contact with him and we stood next to each other uh which you know whatever i mean but i like i because i would have loved to have talked to him because i love the i love the emperor and i love him mcdermott as the emperor uh that would have been good but that's I the didn't, way that the didn't make out go. with him conventions you you, you go to and you have kind of like the line where you don't pay for it and you can like stand there being like, Hey, how's it going? And they're like, Hey, let's talk about stuff. Yeah. Um, I remember we did that at uh, anime NYC where I usually don't care about autographs, but I, I saw it was like the last day that I was there. There were a lot of people just with no line, just kind of sitting there. And I'm like, you know what? I like one piece. I'm going to the, talk to the the <laughs> one piece voice actor or, uh, Jigen from Lupin the Third. Like I have, I have a Jigen figure in my hand. He can sign it. That's great. Yeah. So for like a couple bucks, I would, I I did those lines. But when like the really intense ones, you're right. It is just like boom. Here's your picture. Go. Thank you. Yeah. Wild. You might, you might get a hello, and that's about it. So Finch, when he met Mark Hamill, he was either dressed as a stormtrooper or had a stormtrooper helmet because Mark Hamill signed his stormtrooper helmet, and that's what he's like. Do you remember that, right? Uh, and then Mark Hamill's like <laughs> trying to be polite and did like, I, I'm, I'm here with my friend. He's, you know, going through a hard time. His grandmother died. So, and then Finch's response to, for response to that is like, oh, he must be so sad. Just kind of like you were when Obi-Wan Kenobi died. <laughs> Mark Hamill starts asking him politely and then a little less politely. He says, yeah. I'm asking you nicely to leave. <laughs> and Finch goes, oh, that's what the cop at the convention said. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then it but then Mark Hamill loses it. And it's just like every single day with your questions and all this, like just please go. Uh, and then um Finch like grabs Mark Hamill's fork and runs away. <laughs> uh do you do you have any any weird um celebrity memorabilia that you just kind of like it's not an autograph photo, it's just a strange thing that you have from them? Well, well, I don't know where it went, but I do have a signed juice box from when I saw the strokes in Atlanta uh because <laughs> of their lead single off their third album, Juice Box. No, and we shit. all we had them signed juice boxes. So I don't know, but I don't know where it went. I've got uh so I'm pointing to Jerry Colonna. The mm -hmm. er, the 1930s 40s entertainer. I have a picture, autograph picture of him on, on my wall. I have two of his Christmas cards. Oh, that he sent out to you know just his friends and family and stuff. Huh. So I have well, two of them. Uh, in I mean, I order. I have um, one of Hayden Rourke's speedos. So oh, that's yeah, <laughs> that's true. That his partner gave me, uh, as well as a pocket square and a um, I think a cigarette case. Mm. that might have belonged to his partner um yeah so now we're back at uh blush uh magazine and jack is uh oh so jack the, maya comes into jack's office because she's like he and he has her like what have you been hearing around in the bullpen about you know him not making it he's very embarrassed that he's fallen all the way to number 100 and she maya's response is i don't know it sounds like revolution out there <laughs> She's she's full of shit. She's she's yes, putting him yeah, off because yeah. yeah. no one else cares. He's the only no. one who cares about this. And he's trying to make her care by being like, I want this not just for me, but for everyone to feel proud about where they work, like for our eyebrow guy in shipping or whatever. You can't remember the, guy, the eyebrow. Yeah, you can't remember anyone's names. 
Um, so he, he calls in everybody, the, the main cast, which is four yes. people. And he says, we need to, we need to get in front of this. We need to have some big PR push to get me, uh, in front. And Nina comes up with a great idea. She's like, why don't we just take all the covers from blush for the past year or whatever, and we'll put them in a leather bound book and send them to the editors of the magazine, just to remind them of the impact and influence that you've had. Which is a, a good idea. idea. Yeah. It, now, I what I know about production, you can't do this in a week. <laughs> I mean, and I think there was like today. It was like they needed yeah. it that day. You you can't do what they're saying in leather a bound. Week. Leather bound, getting all the pictures, sizing them correctly, um, figuring out what the layout's gonna be like, probably writing a little bit of copy for it. Yeah. Because uh, the other option is they just take a bunch of the physical magazines, just rip off the covers and take it to a binder or something. But it's like, that is very arts and crafts. I don't know. That's do. not like it's the, do. I do know that people take runs of comic books mm -hmm. and they can, you can take them to a binder and a binder will put a cover on the comics and it protects the comics. And um, I think that's what a lot of, uh, I have a lot of pe pe people do. I have considered it many a time. I don't, but I, I, like the I would have to. I would have to buy back. I would have to buy second edition. Like, I would of, of everything I would want bound. I would have to buy it again and then get that bound because my copies I don't want to fuck with because yeah. they you know they cut off the spines and like sew them together. Yeah, um, and it does. It doesn't make it doesn't make sense to me. Um, it makes sense to probably people who are using them for research purposes. Probably like yeah, the like libraries do that yeah. and stuff and. Oh, makes more sense nice to see all the spines but whatever uh so they do that and nina's like oh well now i'm just gonna say all my i have so many ideas that i never like say and now like wendy malik is just a joy i love it's her funny because she says like <laughs> i have all these ideas that i'm usually too afraid to say because some people and she looks right at maya which is really funny <laughs> so the next uh little so then we go back to the magazine cover and it zooms in on 10 ways to show him you're sorry uh which is like which leads us into what the next scene is which is mark hamill feeling well you find out later he is not feeling this way but he comes back under the guise of i feel bad about snapping at you at that restaurant so i'm going to apologize etc uh but uh, but when he interrupts finch so finch has a very 1998 joke that he says right here where Mark Hamill is walking up on Finch and he's on the phone trying to get these Barney tickets again. And he's like, you need to give me those tickets because in a year, Barney's going to be colder than Hootie's second album. It was the 90s. Which I will go on the record as saying Fairweather Johnson, better album than Crack Review. Hey, Darius Rucker is doing amazing yeah, for he's himself. He's doing great. He's uh, and I, was, back. I saw Hootie and the Blowfish on the Fairweather Johnson tour. So... <laughs> She's a hootie girl. No, no. Uh, yeah, so Mark says that he's come to apologize. Uh, which, while he's doing that, Dennis is calling, like, another 90s joke. He's, like, calling his answering machine to re-record re his outgoing message. And so he says, hi, this is Dennis Finch. And and he holds up the phone real fast to, to Mark Hamill, who goes, Mark Hamill... And he pulls the phone back and says, and, and we're not here right now, so leave You've message. reached the Rebel Alliance, because he starts it off normal, like, you've reached Dennis Finch and Mark, and you've reached the Rebel Alliance, like, then he goes and, like, like he's under attack, and it's, yeah, like, hey, I understand that, <laughs> that can do level that, that, fandom. Now, now it's called Cameo. Yes, um, which I have ordered one... No, so I did do a cameo. You can also do cameo just to DM them. So I um I wanted uh the actor uh oh my god, what oh my Daniel Davis, Jesus, the actor who plays Niles on the nanny. Oh my AKA, god, aka Sherlock. No, he was Moriarty on the next generation episodes where they would do the holodeck stuff. Wow. So I wrote an article about how Nanny is like gay canon and it is very important that it's streaming again. And then also for me personally, like Daniel Davis, I had, of course I had a crush on him as well. But like seeing that like fastidious, snipey, well-dressed 
English sassy man. And I was like, that's me. That's a, not, that's a role model. So I wrote this piece and I was like, well, I want to make sure he sees it. So I paid like the $5 or whatever, just to send him a message. And he wrote me a really nice message back. Uh, you know, I was, I was hoping I would get confirmation that he is a homosexual, but he did not say anything, which that is his prerogative. <laughs> I will not push, but I, I did give him the runway to, 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 to tell me, but he didn't. I have gotten two cameos, both from Megan, one for when I got into grad school and one for my birthday. And they were both from Gibby Hayes. <laughs> uh, Gibby Haynes from the but- Butthole Surfers. But Gibby Haynes, what did I say? Gibby Haynes from the Butthole Surfers. <laughs> People, the best value for your money on Cameo is Gibby Haynes. Because <laughs> my first one was 11 minutes the second one was 15 and he just walks around red hook and <laughs> red hook and just talks about things in his life, things he sees, just talks about history. He just <laughs> talks and it's, it's hilarious. He tells jokes. It's 15 minutes of Gibby Haynes talking to me. It Man. was the best. I, I, oh, I love him so much. <laughs> So I'm on Cameo. Maybe I'll do it at some point. Who knows how big of a deal Barb Hardly is going to become. Are you on Cameo? No. No. I mean, if people want to pay me $5, uh, sure. Slide into my DMs and I'll just do it on Twitter, at Barb Hardly. Or I'll do it on Instagram, I mean. Um, So anyway, Nina then walks over because uh, and she's like, well, 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 Mark Hamill, which was just, I don't know, that made me laugh. It was just like Nina walking, well, 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 Mark Hamill. She auditioned for Leia back in 1976. Uh, oh, and then what did she say about... Um, um, Mark Hamill doesn't remember her because all she did was audition and blind George Lucas with a laser gun, which didn't make sense. Yeah. And then uh, she, as as she's being kind of shuffled off the stage, she says, "If you see Chewbacca, tell him that all is forgiven." Or something yeah, like, like no that. hard feelings or something. Hard feelings. Uh, and then uh, Mark Hamill invites Dennis Finch to go grab a burger, and then we get a voiceover of just trust your feelings, Dennis. Which was which was a real error in the episode. I don't know if you noticed this, no. the, because the voiceover stepped on a really funny line. Well, he the, says, I love you, right? But the he says it because they, they record Dennis, like, looking at the camera, and he knows how long he's supposed to wait for this voiceover to go. But they obviously recorded the voiceover separately. So yeah. the voiceover goes long, slightly long, and Dennis says, I love you, as the voiceover is going. So the the, uh, the audio... Yeah, over itself, and you miss his joke saying "I love you" to Mark Hamill, which to is which Mark Hamill should have said "I know," but yeah. Um, and I do want just Mark Hamill. If you're ever listening or watching, I love you. I love you too. Like, I mean, that's like, like Siri. Like when I think of every now and then, I do like to think of like what celebrities would I, if I were to meet, it would be you know what defcon 5 like it's like <laughs> this is this is uh yeah and mark hamill is a hundred percent uh you know, one of those top of the list so i think he's i i get the feeling from all that he does online and in real life i feel yeah. like he's very down to earth he has r- responded to me on twitter or you know faved like he's yeah he's talked I, I have all those screenshots he, so. he still has that same sweater that he had back in the 70s. I know. Oh, God. Uh, so now the next thing that we see on the cover of the magazine is the compatibility quiz. How does he rank? And it is the next morning and Finch is coming into to work. Or it's like a week later, right? Like, because he comes in and he's like, I've been hanging out with Mark Hamill all week. It is great. He comes over at 5 a.m. Like Gives me donuts because that's when they taste the best. 5 a.m. Yeah, and then he's like, you know, because I treat him just like a normal person, to which Maya responds, oh, really? Does he have action figures of you on his nightstand? Which, <laughs> good. I mean. is, this, is this the scene, though, where where um, so, um, she runs in and says, we have a crisis. And Elliot says, no, no, no. I moved the gin to the bottom shelf. <laughs> and, well, and then, and then, and then uh, Nina says, well, those are five frantic minutes I'll never get back or something. Good jokes. Good. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, and then they find out that they got they got the list. They've already sent out the leather bound thingy thingies, and they've got the list back. And Jackson bumped off because at number forty seven, all of a sudden, is Elliot, aka Enrico Colantoni from Veronica Mars. Yes. He is not number 47 because what that leather bound book of covers reminded all these people of is how good of a photographer Elliot is. Dun, yeah. Dun, dun. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, which is blows my mind. Um, but I absolutely love it because the creative people are getting the recognition and the suits are yes. bumped off the list. Even Boom. if I will say that I do believe that Jack Gallo, George Siegel is wearing the best suits of the late nineties. The nineties are a bleak, bleak time for office, like men's suiting. And I like what, uh, what Jack is wearing. A lot of three and piece, got some double breasted. It's very good. On the flip side, Mark <laughs> Hamill is wearing jackets that are too big for him over yes. t-shirts. <laughs> Lots of like leather over t-shirts. And it's, yeah, yeah. that's, about um, it. but look, that's how we dressed in the 90s. You know, we all have to deal with it. I had a pleather jacket that I got from Hot Topic. No, Gadzooks, because I wasn't I, allowed to go to Hot Topic yet. I did not have leather jackets, but I did have suit jackets that I wore for various things, and I got them from thrift stores, and they were not fitted in the least. See? Now the next uh, the next uh, segment we go to on the magazine cover is what to do when he's too clingy, which perfectly sets up. We like the first thing we shot is the first thing they sh- that we see is Mark Hamill is at Finch's desk. He is like answering. He's like at the phones. He's like picking up the ceramic kitten that is on Finch. Like he is in the business. He says. And then, <laughs> he says, "Oh, you have a you have a copy machine that collates and staples. We could have used that on the Millennium Falcon." <laughs> he tries office, to. He starts for, a for their tickle taxes, fight. I guess. He starts a tickle fight with uh, Finch. Yeah. To which I wrote, sigh, I wish. Um, <laughs> I just, I love him so much. Do, do you do you editorialize in your in your notes? In my notes, yes, yeah. Sigh, I wish, yes. Uh, and then, so like, the, the, we immediately kind of go to the next segment of the cover, which is, can bad news bring you closer? Our experts explain. So Jack has heard that Manhattan Magazine is very impressed with this leather-bound uh, compilation of covers. And... Uh, Cindy Crawford has sent flowers to the new number 47. In 1998, Cindy Crawford was as big as you could get. And she's over here. Ooh, number 47 on Manhattan's most powerful. Well, Let me send these photos. Well, I don't know. She's a, maybe she knows Elliot from, you know, just being a model and he's a photographer. So she's, he's probably just shot her. Yeah. You With see what camera. I did there? See what I did yes. there? Just just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the title of the show is a pun. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so Jack then gathers everyone around, and he's, like, so happy. He's giving a speech because he thinks that he's on the list. He's inferring a lot, which you don't shouldn't do on a sitcom. He says, this year I am number, I'm 47, to which Mark Hamill, under his breath, says, maybe in Wookiee years. Which I love now knowing like so like what Mark Hamill's end game is with this, what what the character of Mark Hamill's end game is with this. I love all these bad jokes. Very smart, very fun. <laughs> Maybe in Wookiee years, or there are. I mean, at this point, they're 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 weird because this is a you know twenty year old piece of media that he is still. All of these things can still hit. It's, 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 I'm trying to come up with something like a touch point that was 20 years ago that we can look at and still everybody knows Wookiees and Obi-Wan Kenobi and the Force and Millennium Falcon yeah. and just being able to like know all those things and it just immediately brings it to mind 20 years after New Hope or, you know, roughly or so. Yeah. Well, and it had just been back in theaters a year earlier. Yeah. Which was the first time I saw them in the theater. I got out of school early in eighth grade. I think I saw Return of the Jedi in theater. I think I did. So he's like, he is so mad. Uh, was it Jack then finds out, right? That he's he's not. And because then he, he like starts yes. calling El- Elliot a hot shot or something. Yeah, he's, he's kind of, gr- he's just really grumpy about it because, you know, he's... He's been 
bumped off the list for one yeah. of his employees. That is a blow to his his ego that he used to, you know, he should have been there. He, you know, what is been. eyebrow guy gonna think? <laughs> um I did at this point wonder why didn't Mark Hamill ever do sitcoms? Because let's let's be honest, in the 90s, on like Harrison Ford kind of took all the momentum. Like Mark Hamill yeah. found voice acting. And so that's where he became legendary in the 90s was voice acting, which, you know, he's Joker at this point in time. So he's killing it. He's Hobgoblin. But, yeah. And Hobgoblin. Uh, but I wonder, like, would Mark Hamill have been? He was on a sitcom prior to Star Wars that was made by MTM uh, called the Texas Wheelers, which we should do at some point. Ooh. Yeah. 70? Um, yeah. It was like 75, 76. It's before. He got Star Wars. Um, should, we yeah, do like, an, should we do an entire block of shows that are just really obscure, weird shit? Yeah, I mean, that's all. Those are what's what's fascinating. That's those are the ones that I like. Like Quark was, yeah. you know, I got so many people talking to me about Quark. About Quark. And, you know, it's Quark of one, all things. A one then, hit wonder. Because we're, one we, we, wonder. the ones that I enjoy the most are the ones that no one remembers. Like, I really enjoyed doing uh life of riley i really yeah. enjoyed doing quark and like finding those weird bizarre little sitcoms but that's for that's for our staff we'll meeting. figure it out <laughs> our staff <laughs> oh boy uh so now the next now we go to the next little segment why alone time can save your sanity because jack is, is he's ooh, this is, in his office he's, i do like so maya comes in and it, it, he's like this is the worst day of my life and then she rattles off a list of increasingly bizarre almost non sequiturs of what should be the worst days of his life like his multiple divorces chris and the crescendo is you sailed a hot air balloon into the chrysler building <laughs> which, which is wild which if you know from the movie q uh actually houses a flying reptile from the prehistoric age i'm oh, just okay, throwing yeah, that out yeah, there yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. terrible fucking movie <laughs> And, uh, oh, and then, so on the intercom rings, and it's like, it's Dennis and Mark Hamill, which is so great. <laughs> I love um, it. <laughs> so Dennis has the the Barney tickets. Finally. And he says that, oh, that's the same day as the Prada um, party. And he's like, well, the most important thing for me is these Barney tickets. Yeah. Uh, shred those, pro pro shred the, the Prada invitation, and you get the callback of Dennis uh, Finch uh, bzz, yeah. <laughs> fake shredding the the Prada tickets, and Maya goes, doesn't work. The shredder's in here with me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so then Maya figures it out. The reason he's not on the list anymore is because he's been turning down all of these hobnobby, gotta go there to be seen, gotta suck up, gotta, you know, yep. look powerful meetings to be a good dad, which is honestly a very nice, neat little bow to tie up that story in. I have also neglected to mention that I've worked in fashion for a hot second. <laughs> uh, so I like know this realm because I, when I was unemployed and doing uh, uh, temp jobs, they put me with uh, Coach, the pocketbook, yeah. Coach, coach bags. Uh, the the president of Coach Reed Krakoff had his own line, and so I was working there, helping them get ready for fashion shows. Uh, like like fashion week, probably fall, I don't know, winter, um, which was wild to be enmeshed in that. Uh, like, like the I remember the day of the show and like walking in and just seeing models, like real models mm -hmm. in person. And it's like, they're all just these six foot tall, super thin women i mean it looked like you were like looking at like the trees wafting you know you know <laughs> and, you know like in mortal Kombat, all those trees and the 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 hand and it goes through everything <laughs> that's such a weird uh <laughs> but no but like it was like oh like i'm and because i'm five six and i was just like this is wild <laughs> um i worked there for a for a while i did two of those shows and i worked in hr and now at decider i have gone to a bunch of uh, fashion shows for Project Rumley and making the cut. I um, have talked to Heidi Klum at length. She is lovely. And uh, Tim Gunn said that he wishes he could get 
an article I wrote about him put on his tombstone, which oh my is God. a really high praise and grim weird praise. And I love it. Um, grim weird praise is the best kind of praise, though. Absolutely the best. That's the purest kind of praise. And I got to visit Christian Siriano's, like his studio, like where he makes everything. And, I could uh, and... I could not tell you what Christian Siriano looks like. You could put them in a lineup of you know two people, and I would guess wrong. He was the I little no Project Runway season four, um, the winner. <clears throat> but yeah, no, it was uh, it was an amazing. So yeah, so you know, obvious, obviously, a woman who looks like this knows her way around the fashion industry. Um, anyway, uh, that's the so end of the it, it wraps the main up. part of the. It, and now yeah, we get the. Up. Uh, the last little act you gotta tie up that b plot where mark is uh <laughs> mark campbell's trying to find dennis and so it's all all they have to establish is that mark hamill sees finch eating ice cream and then just asks him a bunch of questions about working at ice cream stands because he knows at one point he found out finch worked at an ice cream stand during his week hanging out they could have just given him an ice cream cone or just Dennis, David Spade is holding what looks like a baseball helmet sized bowl with just a mountain of chocolate ice cream in it. So much so that I was like, this has got to be part of the, jo-. it's not part of the joke, it's but not. it was ridiculous. It's a huge bowl of ice cream. Diabetes. Yes. <laughs> so then Mark starts asking him a bunch of ice cream questions. He's very, very giddy. And then he finally makes Finch break. Yeah. Yeah. Finch, Finch says, you know, I, you are annoying me. The, the essence, you are annoying me with all your questions and all your comments. And Mark Hamill just expertly turns it around and says, that's what you people do to me every day. Ask me <laughs> these questions and trying to be my pal. And I'm like, he doesn't use the, the Joker voice like I just no, did. No, 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 no. But, uh, but then Finch is like, oh, wait, so you're not crazy. No. And then Finch immediately goes back to super fan. Like, did Chewbacca speak a real language? Is Skywalker Ranch really a ranch? And just like literally chases him off yeah. of the floor. Um, and then Which there's is, a toast. But realize the implication now is that Finch has Mark Hamill's phone number because they yeah. probably have called, you know, he's probably called him a bunch. Late so night talks. Yeah. Uh, and then we have, uh, a t- oh, yes, we, we have the toast. To, uh, Jack is apologizing to Elliot. They're all toasting. They're toasting to Jack for, you know, you're a good boss or whatever. That's like, he, well, no, Jack is toasting. And then they all say, here, here. Oh, no, God damn it. I'm messing up because the flow is really good. It's a very praiseworthy speech of just, you know, this guy made everything possible. He hired me when I was just yeah. starting out. And then he says to Jack, here, here. And well, and, and said, Elliot says, like, if you ever want, like, I can give Rick a call who works at me. No, no, Magazine. no, no. That's is that not? not... That's, no, Jack, Jack goes, those are really imp- important words. Oh, yes. And uh, he, and I, he says, I wish those those guys at Manhattan Magazine could hear that. And uh, Elliot goes, you know, of course, I would tell them that any day. And Jack picks up the phone, goes, you can. His name is Rick. And you'll say like they because they, they go like here, 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 here. His name is Rick. <laughs> like he like they, they insert it into the like round of like here, 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 here. And then when it gets to Jack, he's here. His name is Rick. Give him a call. And it's really good. And it's they're good. Uh, they're a tight little tight little ensemble. Yeah, it's a very small it's a very small cast list on uh Yeah, and it doesn't they don't really I think it's just that cast the entire time. They don't really uh add or lose anyone. They added um Brian Pussain. He was Oh right, because he's like the cameos. male yeah, yeah, he's like the mailroom guy. Uh, are you ready for the must have facts? Yeah. So nine point four million people watched this episode of Just Shoot Me, which was enough to get it to Number 23 for the week. Uh, the top the top five movies or the top five shows of the week. Number five was the uh, CBS Sunday movie Cab to Canada. More on that in a second. Uh, number four was Touched by an Angel. Dark time in television history. Three, Monday Night Football. Oh boy. Two, NYPD Blue. And number one, 60 Minutes. That's a bad top five. Uh, so Cab to Canada. Here's the description. 
fact-based story about a Pasadena cab driver who picks up what he believes is a routine fare, an elderly woman on her way to a funeral. However, the wealthy woman is soon insisting that the cabbie drive her on a cross-country trip that ends up entailing 3,100 miles and ending in Vancouver. Initially contentious, the two eventually find a reluctant friendship growing. And it stars... um. It stars Haley Joel Osment, isn't it? And God, did I close that IMDb page? Because it was a kind of a crazy cast. Da, 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 da. It's based off of I, I remember kind of a real story like this was about the same time, but it wasn't it wasn't an accidental thing. I remember the story was oh, two people were in New York and they took a cab, and it was kind of a long trip in New York, and they really hit it off with the cab driver, and they said, Hey, you know what would you think about if we could hire you for a long drive? And they drove and he's like, yeah. So um, they made arrangements and they came out with like how much it would cost. And he was their show for, for, for a very, very long trip. Mm. It was, it wasn't a, Hey, I need to get to Canada. You know how much it was. It was planned ahead. Um, Cause it made the so, news. So. That's, that's why I remember it. It starred uh, Jason, uh, Jason, uh, Beggy, B E G H E, who God, what was he in? Uh, he was in Alien Nation. Um, he was on X Files. Uh, God, why does that name sound so familiar? Uh, whatever. You know what? Uh, it's got Maureen O'Hara. Yes, Maureen O'Hara, Haley Joel Osment, Catherine Bell, who I believe was on Jack. <laughs> so you know it's a uh it's an interesting uh that's an interesting little movie i'm um, looking at it right now yeah and the uh nbc tuesday night lineup that this aired as part of was mad about you followed by news radio just shoot me a rerun of friends and then dateline and let me tell you that's a good lineup that's a good lineup. I will I will go out, you know, any day and say, yes, that's a good lineup. That is uh, what I would have been watching. But what are you watching? Who? Cool. <laughs> On ABC, we got an episode of Spin City, a holiday dinner broadcast to stress the mayor's commitment to family values goes awry when a fight erupts between the mayor and his father. On CBS, we got Point Last Scene, an original movie starring Linda Hamilton and Mary Kay Place, a search and rescue team hunts for a lost child. No. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, NBC just shoot me. Finch meets Mark Hamill at Bartini's. Don't know why they wanted to put the name of the restaurant in there. <laughs> and is so annoying that the actor turns the tables. And then on Fox, Home Alone 2 lost in New York. Kevin ends up in New York when he boards the wrong plane. Again, which is, with which is, Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, which is also just such a weird description of that movie. Uh, what are you watching? It's 1998, so I am probably watching Just Shoot Me mm -hmm. because I, at this point in my life, I'm 18, I I will have remembered that Mark Hamill is from Star Wars because that description didn't say Star no, Wars. No, it's just Mark Hamill. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I would have I would have had to remember that Mark Hamill was in Star Wars. Because if, if, if I remember my life, I was into Star Wars when I was really young, and then there was that whole desert of there was Dark nothing period, babe. and this was during this was right kind of the tail end of that desert yeah i mean I, this was so there was so much of a desert that when we first got online i want to say this was 1994 before windows 95 this was on dos and the mm -hmm. first time i ever got on a message board because we had just gotten a um we had just gotten a modem and we're like the only thing you could go to was message boards and i was like what can you what can you look up on a message board? What can people talk <laughs> about? And this was my honest to God thought process. Do people still talk about Star Wars? Do they remember Star Wars? Yeah. So me, four, 13, 14 year old Ethan jumping into a uh, Star Wars message board on a Usenet group um, to find out that people did still talk about Star Wars. Yeah, but, I'm sure it was uh, heavily. Getting ready, getting ready to get wild. It was Wild. before it was before they even announced the special editions. See? So this was like so it would have been a 50-50 if my brain had remembered that Mark Hamill was um 
Luke Skywalker. Harrison yeah. Ford, I remember, because he was in Indiana Jones. Because he's Indiana Jones. Yeah. Last came out. Yeah, Last Crusade came out when I was in elementary school. I'm just watching. I'm watching Just Shoot Me because I watched Just Shoot Me. I'm an NBC girl, honey. That was my <laughs> network. I didn't watch Spin City. I was NBC number one. And then ABC had some good shows. Never, ever, ever watch CBS. I almost had like a vendetta against CBS. No thank you to CBS. <laughs> Don't I definitely watch wasn't going to watch I wasn't going to watch Point Last Scene, I'll tell you that. No, I think the only thing that I watch on CBS is Evil. Yeah, now, uh, yeah. Well, now, now I'll watch a CBS something or other, most, most likely Paramount programming. Um, on IMDb, 140 Just Shoot Me-ites rated this episode a 7.4 out of 10. Would you go higher, lower? I'd go higher. I'd, I'd go, go on higher. the other side of that of that, that 7.5. I'd go maybe yeah. a 7.8. Yeah, I think this was a solid. Well, and who had the must see performance of this episode? I should have. I should have planned this better. Oh uh, no, I never. I mean, George I, Siegel, maybe. Yeah, George Siegel was very good. He's Best very dressed, good definitely. I think. I mean, like Mark Hamill did a really good job um, for doing like the guest, the like gratuitous guest spot role that could be very thankless. Uh, it could not have any jokes, but it had a lot of jokes that he delivered. Um, or, I mean, Wendy Malick. Yeah. I would say that o- overall, I like Wendy Malick in the in Just Shoot Me just as a forever mm-hmm. kind of thing. I, I really think George Siegel did a really great performance in this one. But yes, I will give Wendy Malick the star of Just Shoot Me over David Spade. Yeah, he was fine. He was nothing, very David Spade. Yeah, nothing against David Spade. I've loved him since PCU, but... <laughs> um yeah i'd say that this was she's better in this <clears throat> must other people see this episode of television yep yep totally i think i it. think this is a very good uh introduction to just shoot me as well i think that it checks all the box i chose it because of mark hamill uh <laughs> and some people but... and i'm you know pr- people probably will watch this just because it has mark hamill because there are people like you who will will find something and watch every episode that me. Paul yeah. Lynn has guested on, yeah, and like that know. kind of stuff. There are people who just say Star Wars. I will watch whatever it is. Yeah, so I think like this is a good, fun episode that also does. I mean, every cast member gets in a joke. Yeah, uh, I think it's a really good. Um, ta-da! We got we went shot. a little long with this one because I think when we talk about Star Wars, we do tend to go a little bit. Long oh, I mean, I'll is... freak out passion Passion. (laughs) um yeah but you know thanks everybody for tuning in and listening to us talk about just shoot me and star wars and uh yeah (laughs) and also my drag identity and just you know the growth that we're going through (laughs) um but uh yeah i mean where can people find you if they want to chat with you ethan uh find me on instagram at ethan k 55 i will post that picture of me and carrie fisher uh she's a a wonderful wonderful woman we love her in this house uh seen her live i just i think the world of her love her forever love her forever r.i.p carrie yes uh and you can follow me on instagram at at barb hardly uh you can go and watch my christmas special on uh youtube a very barb hardly christmas it's christmas all year long if you're watching my special um (laughs) <laughs> and uh, you can also follow me out of drag on Instagram and Twitter at Brett White. You can read the words that Brett writes, Brett White writes on decider.com. Please rate and review the podcast in iTunes. Uh, subscribe on the YouTube. Send us emails, send us comments, chat us up, and we'll chat you back. Uh, <laughs> we will. We'll read yeah. it on the show. Yeah. And, uh, Thanks to Acast for hosting the podcast. And I mean, that's probably it, right? That seems it for me. We'll see you next time in the 1950s. Ooh. <laughs> What's that? I'm sure it's going to be very, very uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs>